so uh, so what I'm going to talk about now is um, is a, a different but related topic, um, and this is about finding somatic mutations in cancer genome sequencing data, and uh, and this is just an example of what that looks like. <coughs> so this is actually real data. This is four cases with uh, um, the same somatic mutation in uh, in a gene called FOXL2 in a rare form of ovarian cancer. And, um, and this is a, a situation where we have a single nucleotide change induces a, an amino acid change and essentially um, we think changes the function of the protein. So before we get there, um, I think that uh, it's important to revisit the idea of, of cancer as an evolutionary process. Um, and this is a slide uh, from, from Mike Stratton uh, that uh, I think is really quite uh, elegant. And, and it really shows that um, the main concept that cancer arises from an acquisition of abnormal genomes. So, so we start with, our, with normal cells and, and over time accumulate mutations. So, so these mutations are just represented with little glyphs inside the, the cell here. And uh, we all walk around with somatic mutations that, that we weren't born with. Um, and some of them confer uh, a selective growth advantage to the cell. And so, so that's what uh, this star here represents, and that's a, a, an accumulation of, of a driver mutation. And, and I mentioned that, that you know, really loosely defined, the driver mutation is something that changes the phenotype of the cell, and that can get selected for in the evolutionary history of the tumor. And so we get... Um, the formation of a tumor and, and increased rapid proliferation, which can then actually um, create even more mutations, and the mutations accrue over the, the, the lifetime of, of a cancer. Okay. And, um, and so, so just uh, keep bear in mind that this process is, is a, a time-dependent process, and that tumor cells change over time. And by and, and are governed really by the principles of Darwinian evolution and selection. Um, so, so that's that's concept number one that we need to bear in mind. So let's look at just so we're on the same page. This is really simplistic and cartoony, but um, I, I just want to uh, illustrate that this is what we're talking about when we talk about a mutation, um, a point mutation is. It's really, so here's uh, the sequence of, um, this is actually an actual mutation in, in P53, um, a tumor suppressor gene. Here's just a fragment of sequence from the normal cell. Um, and at this res residue right here, uh, we have a, a substitution um, of, a, of a G to a T and in the tumor cell. So, so and what this does is this induces a, uh, a stop codon mutation in, uh, in the tumor cell and, and uh, the protein is, is lost. So this is a, a tumor suppressor gene and, and genetic defects in, in this gene allow uh, cells to evade programmed cell death and, and DNA repair. So I just want to return to this slide and, and go over some of these. Uh, so why are mutations important to, to, to discover in, in the context of not only biology but but, but, but the clinical context, and that's that um, there are uh, a few, few point mutations that are targetable by, by specific drugs, and, um, and, and some of the genes that harbor those are, are EGFR, PI3 kinase, BRAF, and KRAS, and I'll get into um, some of the details around these. Okay. So <clears throat> how many people have seen this? iconic diagram before. Maybe it's already been shown in this workshop. Um, so this is from a classic paper um, from just over 10 years ago uh, by uh, Doug Hanahan and, and Bob Weinberg. Um, and they described, um, it's really a review paper, but, but they described um, cancer as having a few hallmarks. And, um, and these hallmarks are, are essentially biological characteristics or phenotypes um, that, uh, that allow a tumor cell to exist as a tumor cell. And uh, they, they evade programmed cell death, they evade apoptosis, they have self-sufficiency in growth signals, um, they have uh, insensitivity to anti-growth signals, they become independent from, um, from signals that are, are, 
or directing them to, um, to, to stop growing. They have the properties of being able to uh, evade, invade different tissue sources and spread um, a limitless replicative potential and sustained angiogenesis, which is essentially generating a blood supply uh, to those tumor cells. So, so this is all very, very nicely and eloquently described. Um, but uh, what was not known at the time, and still is we're still trying to discover, is essentially what genetic abnormalities underpin the ability of tumor cells to achieve these oncogenic properties, and and then also how how does this change over time, and what what genetic abnormalities drive that process, and finally uh, you know the specific genes. Are, that are involved in, in, in generating this phenotype is, is relatively, was relatively unknown. So, so there's huge potential for uncovering um, can't, uh, the, the properties of, of, of how this happens from the perspective of the genome. Because I showed before, um, cancer is a disease of acquisition of abnormal genomes. And so to understand its properties at its most fundamental level, uh, we need to look at the genome itself. So, returning to the discussion of drivers <coughs> versus passengers, um, and, and this is again, these are loose definitions, but uh, driver mutations essentially can be considered as altering the phenotype at the level of the cell uh, that is selected for in the evolutionary history of the tumor. And, and they mis this, must, this may be visible <coughs> um, in a population of tumors as a result of convergent evolution. So, so convergent evolution just means that, uh, that through different um, in different individuals, the same evolutionary path is, is, is taken. And there's examples of this in nature, um, in, in species, and, and the same thing happens in given tumor types. Something about the properties of, of certain uh, cells and microenvironments uh, in, in anatomical positions in the body and also just the, um, the, the type of cells that obtain mutations that result in, in recurrent mutations in a population. So the same gene will be affected uh, in multiple different individuals from the same tumor type. By contrast, passenger mutations are benign and essentially do not alter the phenotype of the cell. And these are really stochastically or randomly induced. They're likely infrequent in a population. And so uh, by some metric, uh, the recurrence of a particular mutation in a population of tumors, so if you see in 5, 10, 20 percent of, of tumors, you see a gene mutated, that gives you some indication that that might be a, uh, an important gene to look at. So, okay. Um, so we, drivers can really take a uh, couple of different forms. Um, you can have driver mutations that are gain of function. You can have driver mutations that are loss of function um, or switch of function. And uh, it's hard to read here, here but... Um, but th these can actually accrue at different points in the evolutionary history of the tumor. I think we discussed this somewhere along the, the way. So, so we have oncogenic initiating mutations such as K mutations in KRAS, BRAF, EGFR, PI3 kinase, et cetera, um, and tumor suppressors such as uh, P10 and BRCA1. Um, and then you can have drivers uh, that confer uh, metastatic potential or metastatic in initiation. Here's a couple of examples of genes that... Um, harbor mutations that confer metastatic potential, metastatic progression, and, and, and then uh, even, even um, virulence there. And so the other concept that uh, is important is that, so, so we go from drivers that initiate neoplastic transformation, drivers that confer metastatic potential, and then driver mutations that can confer uh, chemotherapeutic resistance. So in, uh, I mentioned that there are, uh, there's a, a target inhibitor against the BCR able um, translocation in CML. I mentioned that in the in the morning lecture. Um, well, so that that's good, and there's the targeted agent is often quite effective. But eventually, uh, tumor cells can acquire resistance to that targeted agent, and they do that by um, by uh, by mutations in the ABL gene. And so here's just a, a couple of um, examples of of mutations that uh, essentially are really not prevalent in the primary tumor, um, but uh, are, acqu are acquired and, and are uh, selected for in the presence of a chemotherapeutic agent. So it allows the cell to essentially become resistant to the, to the kinase inhibitors that, um, that knock down the, the original primary tumors. 
So I just wanted to show an example. This is not in your notes, so this is just two extra slides here. So mutations, um, depending on whether they're oncogenic or loss of function, tumor suppressor type of mutations, they have certain patterns. And that's usually because, um, uh, so here's the PI3 kinase gene. And, um, and what's shown here is, uh, is the prevalence of PI3 kinase mutations uh, as a function of, of the amino acid position. So, so it's just shown here as the amino acid position. Here are some domains. Um, and, and then the y-axis is just the frequency that that's observed in, it, in a given population. And you can see that there are really two positions that are, um, that are disproportionately represented. And that's because um, uh, the mutation here uh, really changes the function of the protein in such a way that that drives the oncogenic potential of the, of the downstream signaling. And, and both of these, um, these hot spots, they do that. And, um, and so, so this is what's called an activating or oncogenic mutation. And other examples are, for example, KRAS codon 12. So usually codon 12 or codon 13 um, in KRAS in, uh, in pancreatic and in other, uh, uh, other tumors, um, that's the, the location that's mutated. And if you see a mutation there, then that chances are that's going to be the driver oncogenic mutation. Okay. And same with BRAF V600E. So in about 70% of melanomas harbor this very specific mutation. So at amino acid 600 of the BRAF gene, you have this substitution uh, uh, V to E. And, and this, is a targetable, um, this is a targetable mutation as well. Okay, so, so that's the, the pattern of oncogenic mutation. So when looking at a panel of tumors, if you see the same codon uh, hit maybe multiple times, uh, then that could be an indication that that's an important um, hotspot mutation to look at. The tumor suppressor pattern is very different. So uh, here what's shown is uh, from a paper that, uh, that my group is involved in, um, published in, in, in New England Journal of Medicine. And this is, uh, David Huntsman will probably talk about this tomorrow as well. Um, and, and what this is, is uh, mutations in a gene called ARID1A. It's involved in the Sweet-Sniff chromatin remodeling complex. And, and we think this is a tumor suppressor because essentially we have a, a, a pattern of a mutation that spans the whole gene. And, and most of these are, um, are inactivating stop codon mutations or uh, frame shifting indels that will result in a truncating protein. And so in this case, it, the, 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 the whole, um, what's getting selected for is a loss of the protein. So it doesn't matter how you get there. Whereas in this case, um, the, what's being selected for is a very specific phenotype that's driven by mutations in these particular amino acids or in these parts of the protein. Um, and so, so these have very different patterns, but, but one can leverage this. So, so if you see a gene that's recurrently mutated, and, and, and the, the majority of mutations are, are stop codon mutations or frame shifting uh, insertions and deletions, then, then one can start to infer that that's a, a loss of function or tumor suppressor gene. Okay. And the same pattern is, is, is exhibited in, in genes like P53 and BRCA1 and 2. All right? Okay. So, so let's dig into this idea of cancer as an evolutionary process. So this has been thought about for quite some time. Uh, uh, 35 years ago, uh, this paper by Peter Knoll was published. It's the same guy that found the Philadelphia chromosome in CML. Um, and, and, what he, um, and what he showed here is, is really that, um, I mean, what does this look like to you? I mean, anyone who's done kind of ecology or evolution type of studies, it's a, what is it? Yeah, it's a phylo phylogenetic tree, right? It's an evolutionary tree. So, and that's exactly what it is. Um, and, and so, so he... With the sorry? With the bottleneck event. Right? That's right, yeah, yeah, sure. Um, and so, so what he um, w w was, was describing essentially is, as the process of, of tumorigenesis and progression as, as an evolutionary process where, um, e you know, we start with a normal cell and we acquire um, the tumor initiating event here. And then um, through, uh, through, through stochastic acquisition of different mutations, um, uh, those mutations essentially get propagated forward. And some, some clones just, just die, and they don't, they don't make it out. That's what these ones are. 
Um, so these would be uh, cells that, that acquire a, a, a new mutation that, but that don't get selected for. But then some go through these process of, of, of actually being selected for and then further branching and further differentiation. And one of the key concepts here is that early events are propagated throughout the, the tree. And so um, all the cells at this stage, um, they'll, they'll harbor these initial, these initial early mutations because they get carried forward, generally speaking. Um, but but the, the, the clones at this stage, um, they'll have their own unique mutations um, that differentiate them. And so, and so these would be rather rare in the cellular population of a tumor, um, but the mutations that happen early will be quite frequent. So that's a, con that's a concept we need to, um, uh, to think about. And, and that's really um, illustrated in, in this schematic. So, so let's start to think now of of a tumor as a, as a collection of distinct populations of cells. Um, and this is a cartoon where the tumor has 12 cells, and um, half of the cells uh, are, have this particular genotype. And, and what that is is that basically it harbors these three mutations, mutations A, B, and C. Um, and then we have this, this little uh, population that has just mutations A and B, and then we have this population that has the, the mutations A and D. Um, and, and so when we look at the abundance um, in terms of how many cells harbor each mutation, you can see that A is present in all the cells. And so we'll have what we call a clonal frequency of, of 1.0. Uh, B is in two-thirds, uh, C is in half of them, and D is only in a third. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. So, so the, the fundamental questions, though, that arise from this type of uh, situation are... Um, you know, do clonal genotypes actually drive different phenotype behaviors? Um, we don't really know the answer to that in a large scale. Uh, and, and how does this relate to treatment response, progression, and metastasis? So if I have a clonally diverse tumor at the, at the outset in the primary stage, um, is that going to have some predictive effect on whether, uh, whether a patient is going to respond well or poorly to a given therapy? Um, these are the questions that... Um, that are, that are as yet unknown, and, and the question is, you know, how, can we, how can we measure this? Did you arrive at C as a C, uh, because it's in uh, six cells here. Yeah, six out of 12. Okay, so, um, well, the advent of next-gen sequencing uh, has made these types of questions uh, accessible to us now. And, um, and not necessarily related to clonality, but um, in, in, some, in some ways it is, but, uh, but, but actually just in terms of even one level above that, just trying to find um, recurrently mutated genes, there have been lots, lots of early successes. This is a very partial list. Um, every week in Nature, if you open up uh, uh, Nature, you'll probably see a new paper on a different tumor type that is describing a, a novel um, a cancer gene that was not previously known to be implicated in that disease. Um, this is just a few examples. Um, insights into tumor evolution. We and others have shown that um, that sequencing uh, uh, technology, and I'll explain how, how we use this to to model tumor evolution, uh, is is yielding uh, great new insights. Um, we're, we're getting insights into genomic architectures of cancer. Um, you, you looked at rearrangement data yesterday, and um, finding uh, new new processes like chromothripsis that that not only um, drive the biology, but have some sort of clinical prognostic significance in terms of what their architectures look like. And all this is driving towards uh, redefined mutational landscapes. And, and a mutational landscape of a tumor is basically the comprehensive set of mutations that, that govern the biology of that particular tumor. And, and, and we're really coming towards, uh, towards uh, achieving this, this goal. It's really quite remarkable. And, and, and this is really, uh, a lot of this is being driven by two massive in, uh, initiatives, uh, the TCJ or the Cancer Genome Atlas Project, um, I mentioned a couple of papers, and the ICGC, which um, which uh, OICR plays a, a major role in. So uh, you've probably already gone over this, so I'm not going to spend too much time on how the um, how the assay actually works, but um, but, but essentially w where we are at right now is we have the 500 gigabase run. Um, so, so literally 150 times uh, haploid coverage of, of the human genome is achievable now in 10 days. This is, this is just absolutely astounding. This is astounding. This costs um, 
uh, well, for, for a 30x coverage, it costs about $5,000 right now. So, so you think about the effort that went into the, the Human Genome Project um, that was uh, essentially you know, still being refined but, but largely complete in 2003. Uh, this was more than a decade of work. It was more than th several thousands of people were involved and, and, and more than a billion dollars uh, was poured into the, uh, to the generation of the Human Gen Genome Project. And, and the, um, what these machines can do is several times the capacity of that project uh, in terms of data generation, not interpretation and analysis, but in terms of data generation uh, in a matter of days for a, a small fraction of the cost. Five days. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so so that's um, you've you've seen all that, heard all that probably from John McPherson. So, um, so here's a concept that I I want to make sure we all understand. One of the biggest innovations of next gen sequencing is the concept of digital allele counting. Um, Sanger, the Human Genome Project was done with, with capillary-based sequencing, which essentially averages the alleles uh, in a given uh, mix, and you get a, an aggregate um, soft representation of, of whether that allele is present. In, uh, in this type of sequencing, uh, we're approaching uh, uh, single molecule sequencing, and what that means is that, say we have a mixture, so this is my DNA pool that I'm sequencing. And Within this pool, uh, I have 30% of my DNA fragments um, harbor a particular mutation. And that, that's roughly proportional, let's say, to the cell, not per percentage of cells that harbor a particular mutation. Um, when I do my sequencing and I get my reads out, um, those, those mutations will be present in roughly the same proportions as they are in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the pool. And Moreover, is that if we sequence this very, very deeply, uh, we have sensitivity to detect alleles that are relatively infrequent. So they can be even down to 1% one, 1 of the allelic fraction or even sub 1% of the allelic fraction. And that has tremendous implications for how we can interpret mutations. Um, and, and I'll elaborate on that. Okay. So. Um, and I just wanted to then uh, talk about, uh, you know, just a general workflow for, 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 for um, how we can uh, interpret mutations. Um, so, so we start with unaligned reads. We end up with, um, we do some alignments, which you've, you've covered. Um, and then when we get the aligned reads, we can start to then do some inference, and we can make some predictions of what's going on in the biology of the tumor. So we can predict some single nucleotide variants or somatic mutations. Um, and then we can, then, then usually what we try to do is try to validate these. So, so it's still an imperfect science to try to get um, uh, uh, true somatic mutations from this data. We're getting much, much better at it. But, um, but validation is, is still pretty important. And so there are three possible outcomes that, that one can have from each one, each event that we're trying to validate. So, um, so that can be that it's a confirmed somatic mutation. Um, it can end up being a, a germline polymorphism that we just missed. Um, we didn't see that in the normal, let's say, um, or it could just be a false positive due to machine noise or uh, alignment artifacts. And, and this is a major problem, um, and we're going to revisit the sources of this, um, these false positives in, 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 throughout the day. And finally, you know, we have some, um, what we want to do in the end is, is, is actually establish some sort of clinical relevance or, or uh, or biological significance of, of things that we find confirmed. Um, what is the functional significance of a confirmed somatic mutation? So that's generally the, the workflow that um, when sequencing a, set, a tumor or a set of tumors that, that we like to think about. Okay, so now we get into the fun stuff. So um, statistical considerations for, for modeling these allelic distributions. Um, uh, I'm going to sound like a broken record, but I think this is important to um, say again. Uh, cancer genomes have specific properties that do warrant specialized analytical strategies, okay? So uh, we have the tumor normal admixture problem. We have the intratumoral heterogeneity problem. Um, with respect to, uh, to modeling allelic distributions, and I'll, I'll show how this, this is a problem, um, Genomic instability plays a, plays a major role here. So, so you saw how copy number changes can skew the allelic 
um, expected allelic distributions. And we need to be able to account for that. Um, and then uh, finally, the, the experimental design to capture somat somatic mutation uh, necessitate the, um, the sequencing of uh, normal germline DNA and tumor DNA. So we have a pair of samples, generally speaking, uh, for each uh, tumor that we want to look at. And, and that creates um, new opportunities and challenges in terms of how we deal with the data. So, so the first step is, uh, is to align um, all these sequence reads to a, a reference sequence. And when we do that, we get something that looks like this. Okay, so, uh, so it's like assembling a giant jigsaw puzzle, and there are lots of tools to do that. Um, but, but the key thing here is that I just want to show that uh, this is what the data actually looks like. And I think Gavin showed something very similar, where uh, the red bases here are uh, putative variants. Um, and, and the black bases are positions that actually match the, the, uh, the reference genome. And, and so we can, we can make use of this and, and interpret uh, these allelic counts uh, using statistical models. So, so for somatic mutations, the, 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 I just want, I'll, I'll go over a couple of methods that we've developed in my lab. And, um, and these, these were really driven by um, some of the, the problems that we encountered when we uh, first started looking at the data a few years ago. Um, so one of the bigger problems is, uh, so, so let's just say we're dealing with exome data, but you could easily put genome data here. Um, so, so the key thing is that uh, we look at the tumor and the normal data simultaneously. So they both go as inputs into, into these models. The joint SMB mix model, what it does is it, um, it, it's a statistical model that simultaneously emits the tumor and normal allelic counts. And I'll show you that graphically, what that means. And the key concept here is that we borrow statistical strength uh, to better detect germline polymorphism. So, so you can imagine that uh, in sequencing a tumor uh, in, a, in, a, in a normal genome, um, the, I mentioned that there are copy number germline polymorphisms that show up in the tumor. Um, and, that, and the very analogous problem exists in the sequencing um, single nucleotide world as well. And, and because um, most uh, tumor projects are, are, are garnered uh, towards finding somatic mutations, um, what that signal tends to get lost in a sea of germline polymorphisms. And so it becomes um, very advantageous to try to capture as many of those germline polymorphisms as possible. And so we've developed uh, uh, some models to try to borrow statistical strength across these two samples to better detect germline polymorphisms. So that's one source, and this is what I call biological noise. This is, um, this, these are germline polymorphisms. We call, them, we call this biological noise. The other type of noise in the data is machine noise. Um, and and th these would be um, false positive variants that um, are induced by artifacts in the machine. Um, and so, uh, so we developed a machine learning based classifier to better detect these machine artifacts um, trained on, uh, on a large data set. And the key thing is that both methods improve sensitivity and specificity of mutation detection compared to independent or standard methods. And this is an example of where uh, the specific case of, of, the, of cancer biology that has driven the experimental design of a tumor normal pair uh, has necessitated, um, you can say necessitated or given the opportunity for very specific methods uh, for, for cancer. And, and these are two examples that, that, that we've developed. Yeah. So, when it comes to the germline mutations, aren't there important examples of yeah, basically yeah. germline mutations that cause susceptibility to cancer? A absolutely, absolutely. So, so there are uh, uh, so familial cancer, uh, inherited disease, um, it warrants different strategies uh, for sure. Um, what I'm talking about today is really sporadic cancers that don't have an inherited component, um, but uh, um, it's, it's a different. It's a it's a very different experimental design. A different question so altogether. Like, yeah, that's so right. So so what you'd want to do is is with inherited diseases is, is sequence um, related family members, um, with affected people, unaffected people, and, uh, and 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 start to narrow down on doing linkage analysis and things like that. So that's a very different process than than this type of um, analysis. 
Um, so, so here, um, what I'm showing is, is this idea of um, using joint genotypes uh, of samples based on paired sequence data. And, and the major use case is these tumor normal pairs. And so, so that, that's just shown here, um, what, are, what are the possibilities? If we have um, uh, what's shown on the, the right axis here is the, um, uh, the, the percentage of reads that would match the reference or be wild type. And, and what's shown on the left is the percentage of reads that uh, are wild type for the normal. And so in, in, in this little landscape, so uh, this corner here would represent basically a wild type. So you'd have basically, the, if that's the case, then you'd have um, no evidence of a, of a variant at all. So, so that's just what we call wild type. If uh, most of the reads are wild type in the normal, but variant in the tumor, um, then this part of the curve light, lights up, and that's the somatic mutation part of the curve, and that's what we want to try to detect. Um, you'll note that a large proportion of the, the landscape here is dominated by a germline. And this is just where you have any kind of signal that is even weakly represented in the, both the normal and the tumor, um, then, then we want to call that a germline polymorphism. So, so we want to create a model that, that can actually uh, look at this. And then um, the, the last case is, is where we have a um, uh, variant in the normal, but uh, as you show, as Gavin showed at, at the extreme, so we're either wild type, uh, wild type in the tumor, or or all variant in the tumor, um, and this is the the LOH the loss of heterozygosity case. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just trying to wrap my head around wild type tumor. So in other words, like 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 you know, like like you have a known reference tumor that you think this is what it should look like. Um, no, not really. So so this is just um, at a given position, you would call this wild type if the tumor. Um, if the reads that stacked up at the tumor were um, all wild type, and the reads that stacked up at the normal were all wild type, um, then then you'd want to call that, classify that position as being a wild type position. Wild type as being not being a No variant there. Okay. And you're comparing those to the reference genes. They both are, are both are compared to the reference. So so let's there get into that. Three that's right. That's right. Oh, yeah. Not. Yeah. So 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 that that that's shown here actually. So. So here you have the reference, and you can you take the normal, and you take these reads and align them to the reference, and essentially you convert this matri this alignment matrix into what we call uh, an allelic count um, uh, vectors, and and so this basically captures the um, the number of reads that uh, match the reference that at each position, okay. So um, and then this is the number of total reads at that position. So here you have a position that um, you have. <coughs> Uh, all the reads, uh, all seven reads are, are variant, okay? Um, and then here you have a, a position where you have seven reads that pile up there, um, and, uh, and, and four reads are, are variant, three are, are reference, okay? Um, and then you do the same thing for the tumor. So, so you can see how uh, we have this position here, that's, that's shown in red, um, all the reads match the reference and so our, our non-variant or wild type. But in the tumor, we have um, good evidence. There's three reads here that, um, that are variant. And that, this is a very strong indication that that's a somatic mutation. So we have a very clean signal for wild type in the normal, but we have a strong, and we have a strong signal for uh, variant in the, in the tumor. And that's, that's a good somatic mutation. These other two are germline polymorphisms. And of course, you know, since the tumor cell evolves from the normal cell, they carry forward the germline polymorphisms. And so, uh, so these, these um, positions are, are manifest as variants in both the tumor and the normal. And that's why we want to capture these as germline alleles um, and capture this one as a somatic change. So that, if we look at a table and we look at the, the probability of, uh, of these joint genotypes in the normal along here and the tumor, um, we can see that, uh, you know, this position, uh, we, we can assign potentially a probability that our genotype is um, wild type in the normal and variant in the tumor. Okay, and that's just a, a joint probability. So, um, so just to illustrate this again, so the, the problem here is that the genotypes are highly correlated. You have germline polymorphisms that are present in the tumor sample. And our solution is to borrow statistical strength to capture these signals and better, better focus on what is different between the tumor and the normal. Okay. So, um, so I think to, to save on time, I, I'm not going to go into detail on this model. 
Uh, you can ask me about it later, but, but basically we have this simul the, the key concept is that we can borrow strength to, uh, to infer the joint genotype um, from both data sets. And, uh, and we have some, some metrics that we published uh, to show that this, this does better than, than the standard methodology. So, so that's good. That's great. So we can find, uh, we, we do a pretty good job at, at um, reducing this possibility, the confirmed germline. But we're still left with uh, a number of false positives. And so, so what's contributing to that? So, so why, why do we get these, these false positive predictions? Um, <clears throat> so there are a couple of reasons. So this is uh, data shown in IGV, where we have on the top, we have uh, the tumor reads. Each one of these bars represents a read that uh, that is aligned to the, the genomic position that's indicated by the, the red bar here. So this is where we're looking. And, um, and so what's colored here is when you have a nucleotide that, that, that uh, is, a, is a reference mismatch. Um, so this is a mismatch, and that's what's shown here. And, and if you look at this, you would say, wow, okay, so I've got some signal in the tumor here. Um, it looks like there's, a, there's, there's some variant there. Uh, but, and I look in the normal, and it looks pretty clean. There's not much action going on there, so this is probably a somatic mutation. Um, so this turns out to be uh, just a misalignment. These reads are misaligned. They shouldn't be put here. But, and when they are aligned here, it induces this, this illusion of being, uh, uh, being a variant. And so this is a misalignment artifact. Why didn't the misalignment occur in the normal? Yeah, that's a good question. So, so there may be some you know, the additional errors that, um, so you can see some of these reads have additional, um, additional errors that uh, uh, may have caused this misalignment to, to this position. Um, and that might be an inter-experimental variability that um, in those particular reads, uh, the experiment for the tumor created some abnormalities that, uh, th that the machine induced um, that didn't happen when the normal was sequenced, for example. So this is something to watch out for. So let's look at what insertions and deletions do. Um, oh, sorry, let's go back. Oh, yeah. So, well, it's true. You, you could say that this is a misalignment um, in the tumor, right? And visually, why do you know that's the case? Because it's so it doesn't match the one below. Yeah, so if you take, um, so if you, what we did is we actually took some of these reads and then we um, used a, um, kind of a more sensitive alignment tool. And it turns out that they could be um, placed elsewhere in the genome, but with um, just one mismatch, for example. Yeah. So that's how we know. And so here's an example. Um, insertions and deletions here. Uh, so when you have uh, a deletion, it's shown with this kind of black bar. So these are reads that have this deletion. And um, so, so in this case, we just happen to have uh, uh, come across a, a few reads here that um, you can see that there's just kind of all kinds of noise in the data here. Um, but there, there are these reads here that have this, this gap. And it really should have quite a, a longer gap. Um, but, and then what that, what that does is it creates this kind of false, uh, uh, this false call of, of, um, of a variant in the tumor again. And, and, and the normal just wasn't susceptible to that. And again, this is probably just due to um, stochastic fragment selection uh, in the library construction that led us to this position. So if you were browsing this data, if you were just looking at from this at, in a computational way, and you're counting up the alleles that, uh, the allelic counts that look here, and you say, look, I've got three out of, um, I don't know, 20 or so that uh, look like, uh, that look like there's a variant in the tumor, and then I have 50 reads in the normal that don't show any sign, um, that's probably a good indication of a somatic mutation. But if you look in the surrounding neighborhood, um, there's all kinds of funky things going on due to insertions and uh, due to deletions in this case, and that's causing again misalignments. And these these reads probably need a, a bigger gap, um, and then that would cause uh, the, the a gap to be open and push the alignment of of these nucleotides um, somewhere else. Okay. So, yeah. As a general rule, can we say that any SMBs in close by these indels are high likely? Generally speaking, that tends to be the case. Yeah. But can yeah. that be most phrased? It can, yeah. How would those These are these are actually variants that, that didn't validate. Yeah. 
Um, so, so here's one that uh, where you have just you have there, you can barely see it, but there's a whisper of um, when, when one thing I haven't really gone over is that uh, the the base call is actually a probabilistic entity. Okay, so so you, you the machine actually produces uh, uh, not just the call as to what the nucleotide is, but actually it produces a vector of four values. What's the probability that it's an A? a C, a G, or a T. Um, and, and what this, what IGV does is actually it, it shades the, the, le the mismatch um, in terms of intensity um, according to how well, the quality of that read. So, so the quality of that base call. So for example, here we just have um, faint whispers of a, of a variant, but, but this may have just been above the threshold cutoff for our quality, for example. So, so when we're dealing with discrete counts, um, uh, what we do is we, we usually um, establish a threshold and, and apply that. We've actually, you know, then gone and modeled this this uh, probabilistic base calling, which does a much better job. But still, um, what most people do is they they have some sort of cutoff that says, okay, well, um, uh, what's my cutoff of base quality to to actually call a nucleotide a nucleotide? Um, and when we do that, uh, these bases get admitted. Into the into the um, analysis space, and again, this is a uh, uh, only present in the tumor, and so it creates the illusion of a uh, uh, of a somatic mutation. And what's very likely is that these are just machine errors; they're missed calls uh, of the bases. And so you can imagine if you're you're producing um, 500, 500 billion uh, base calls per run on an Illumina machine, there are going to be some errors, and and this is an example of that. Okay. Um, another thing to watch out for is when um, all the variant reads are from the same strand, um, and and so what uh, IGV does is it um, it puts a little uh, puts a little notch um, on the direction of uh, so you can tell the direction of sequencing, and if um, if all the reads that harbor the variant are in the same direction, the chances are very high that that's just a uh, an artifact of, of the PCR, so the PCR gets stuck in a kind of a stutter step and, and is disproportionately amplifying that particular fragment. And, uh, and so that, that's, a, that's just a machine-induced artifact. And, and these are all examples that um, don't occur in the normal, and that's just really by random chance. I mean, um, so you ask that question, and when you're dealing with the space of a genome, um, these are just a couple of examples. Uh, uh, you know, even, even 100 events out of 3 billion um, end up Coming forward to the to the to the prediction space because um, uh, they look like they're interesting events, but this is something that can be modeled as well, um, and, and I'll get to that. So this is another example of an artifact. And so so here's one. Uh, sorry, this one is flipped around. So this is the tumor, and this is the normal now. Um, and and this one is kind of unexplainable. So why don't we? Why why are we not able to validate this one? Um, there's no no sign of, uh, of of poor base quality. There's no sign of an indel. There's no sign of strand bias. Um, and, but yet this one doesn't validate. So so what's going on here? We don't, we don't really know. Um, this one's a mystery. Okay. Uh, and so this could be that the validation assay didn't work. <laughs> that's that's another possibility. So so the validation assay is imperfect as well. And um, and so this would be one that you know you may want to try again. But. Yeah. How many reads can you use because of this? So how many reads are you deleting? Um, well, percentage. So so what we tend to do is um, instead of deleting reads, is rather just um, I'll explain how we how we handle that. Yeah. So that that one that one. Um, well, so what we would expect is, yeah, it's the same same extraction, yeah, same extraction. Yeah. But that that would be true if you did a re-extraction uh, from a different part of the tumor or a different different section, um, then it's very possible you wouldn't see it. Yeah. How do you validate? Like using this method, you can't find anything of uh, snips. Uh, Maybe this is a new one, right? Oh yeah, no, no, this is this is all new. These are all new. 
How do you validate that? So, so then you, um, I'll get to that. So you basically you can design um, PCR primers around your variant of interest, generate an amplicon, and resequence using different techniques. So you can use Sanger or you can use um, targeted uh, next-gen sequencing um, to, get, to get very deep coverage of that particular idea. Okay, so uh, here's some true positive examples. So, so this one is a, is a real mutation validated. So here you just have um, a few percentage of the reads that, that has harbors this particular variant. Uh, this is one that validated. Um, so here's one that uh, also validated. And you have uh, a very weak representation in the, in the, in the tumor. Okay? But only two out of, say, 35 reads um, have this particular variant. And, uh, and so, so, so that we want to be able to capture this because it's a true somatic mutation, um, and it affects the, the amino acid sequence of a protein. Um, and so, this is a just, just just to illustrate that this is a very challenging problem, especially in the con in the context of tumor heterogeneity. So, um, so this might be present in in ten percent of cells or less. Um, and so, so the chances of finding it in a thirty x genome or a fifty x exome um, is pretty small. And um, so you want to be able to leverage this. And, and this is where the joint um, modeling also helps. So if you have a very clean signal in the normal, um, the signal required in the tumor uh, to call a variant um, is, is it, it requires less, um, less signal there. OK. So, so how can we deal with this? Uh, well, so we set out to, um, uh, to try to, to cope with the, all these problems. Uh, in a unified framework, because you can't, you won't, nobody will be able to go through and, and look at each mutation in IGV and, and plot, because you literally get thousands of mutations per tumor sample that, that one's sequencing. And so how, how do you cope with this? We need a, a, an effective, intelligent way to, to cope with all this, um, all, all these, these issues. So, so what we tried to do is we tried to enumerate um, what are all the characteristics that we can extract from the data at a given position? So, uh, and, and all that is really captured in the alignment data. And so, so from there we can get base quality, we can get uh, how well the read aligns to the given position, we can get uh, where in the read uh, the variant is, is located, we can get the strand bias uh, or the, the, the strandedness of a particular uh, read that, that harbors a variant. Um, and uh, we can get proximity to an indel. So we can compute all of this. And so, so we, we enumerated literally 106 features, uh, 40 features uh, each from the tumor and normal, and then 26 features that we were able to extract from both the tumor and normal data. So there's some sort of aggregate um, feature. And they really, uh, they comprise the, the things I talked about. So base quality, mapping quality, um, uh, homopolymer runs. So when you have you know, the same base uh, repeated many, many times, that can create problems for the machine. Uh, so we can, we can model that, strand bias, et cetera. Um, and, and, and this concept is, is uh, implemented in the, in the GATK um, for single samples. But for what we did is we, we used the tumor and normal data simultaneously. And so what this shows is um, taking all this 106 dimensional space and collapsing it down using principal component analysis, um, you can see that um, the data points that rep represented true somatic mutations are really separable from those that are germline or wild type. And, uh, and so this gave us some confidence that, that we should be able to um, cr create a machine learning classifier that can do this. So we set out to do this. <clears throat> and. Um, I found that we really dramatically increased uh, accuracy in our mutation calling by taking into account all these different features. So this is an ROC curve. How many people have seen an ROC curve before? Okay, a few. Um, and so what's plotted here is the false positive rate, or 1 minus the specificity. And then on the, the y-axis is, uh, is the sensitivity, or true positive rate. And, and you want to be up here in the top left corner. And so what's shown here is when we used features to call the data um, in, in, in a, in a cross-validation uh, classifier structure, um, what we found is that um, what really mattered is that we used all these different features. Um, and the, the type of classifier, which is, uh, this is random forest, 
Bayesian additive regression trees, uh, support vector machines, and logistic regression, um, that made little difference. But um, all, all of these classifier, feature-based classifiers, outperformed the simpler models that, that didn't take into account all these features or used the threshold, uh, ad hoc thresholded methods to, to actually um, call mutations. Um, and then, so this was all trained on um, exome data, um, exome capture data, and then uh, sequenced by Illumina. And we had a, a ground truth training set, a ground truth test set from um, whole genome data, whole genome shotgun data from a completely different platform, the solid platform. And we found that essentially the same trend was there too. So, so this, this machine learning classifier that we developed is actually uh, really quite robust. And, uh, and, and it's unequivocal that taking into account all these different features um, and both the t from both the tumor and the normal data, um, it really dramatically improves uh, somatic mutation detection. So, so, so the lesson is really that you know you want to be able to screen out germline polymorphisms, and you want to be able to screen out all the artifacts that are induced by the machine, and there there are many many of them. Yeah. How, how do you label your data by hand or like? You need some no. So, 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 so we validated them all. Right? So we called them with a naive method, and then went back in. And, and did the validation experiment as I described. So we, we designed amplicons around each um, each prediction, and then if uh, the variant was seen again uh, above a statistical threshold in the tumor, and there's strong evidence for there not being a, a variant in the normal, then we can call that a somatic mutation. So there might be a bias because you're using a label that might be wrong, and then you use that validation. No, well, the possible outcomes are that you have, so you take the naive way of just looking at, uh, ignoring features, okay? Call all the things that look like a somatic mutation, including all those artifacts that I showed you, okay? So then you, you have three possible outcomes. You have a uh, confirmed somatic, you have a germline, or you have a false positive, okay? And so that's what we used. Uh, then we used actually binary classifiers, so we just looked at the somatic versus the other two. And then a cross-validation, routine. Um, there are th these are 3,000 data points, so actually we were able to, to separate um, using cross tenfold cross-validation and train the classifiers and had a held out test set uh, and then see how well we did on the test set. The thing that, you know, I'm not sure, like, how did you decide about, like, the ground truth of the labels, like those three labels? And the outcome of the validation experiment. So, so we sequence, sequence using exome capture, okay? That gives us some set of allelic counts that we use to then just call something as somatic or not. Okay, that we actually all then we, we only use somatic. So we, we took all the predicted somatic just from the allelic counts, ignoring all the other stuff. Okay, we took all those positions and revalidated them using a, using the the technique that I described. Some of those were confirmed somatic. Some of those were not. That establishes the label. And then we go back in and use the features in the same positions and see if that helps. And, and to avoid circularity, we use the cross-validation. And because we have 3,000 positions, we could use 10 different um, cross-validation, uh, 10-fold cross-validation. Is that clear? Yeah. Okay. Okay, so, so the other thing we noticed, this is quite important. So then we took all the, um, <clears throat> we took all the, the resulting false positives. And, um, and we found that actually there are essentially uh, six different groups that, um, that yield uh, false positives. So there are six different sort of cl classes of, of false positives that um, can, can be extracted from the data. The first um, is, is dominated by strand bias. So this is a group that, uh, and so what's shown here is just a heat map. And um, each, each column here is a feature. Uh, and then uh, each, um, each row in, in this matrix is a mutation. And, and so then we clustered the features uh, to try to group the mutations into different classes. Um, and so the first group is, is really dominated by strand bias um, and, and unequal mapping qualities in, in both the tumor and the normal. And, uh, and, and then we had basically low confidence in terms of the genotypes. Then we had a group two, which was really dominated by strand bias, and this very interesting um, sequencing error. So we looked at um, essentially the local context and found that a large number of variants, this is a huge, huge number here, 
um, were all of the following. So where you had um, uh, what should have been a GGT, so a trinucleotide that ended with a T, so GGT was being read as a GGG by the machine. Um, and so, so this, is a, this is just a systematic um, artifact that, uh, that is experiment specific because it wasn't always in the normal as well, otherwise we wouldn't have called those in the first place. Um, and, and so this is, a, this is just a, a property of the, um, the Illumina machines that when they encounter a GGT, they often misread it as a GGG. So it's something to be aware of. So with a different platform, you would have to get different yeah, yeah, and it, well, in fact, this this what's interesting is that this this phenomenon exists in different platforms as well, including Sanger sequencing. The same. Yeah, similar. Yeah, yeah. Um, but but you're right. So if we there are different different platforms with many different characteristics, and so what we're working on now is actually um, developing this for different platforms as well. Um, then we had uh, a, a second group that was essentially due to misalignments um, because of repetitive sequence. So so when we looked at that those were the low mappability regions, um, and then we had uh, a group that had the same error but with low base quality, and finally we had this um, group that um, that was really interesting because they um, they have properties. You can see this is this is what somatic mutations look like in terms of its feature profile, if you will. Um, so so these are the features that light up um, in the somatic, and you can see that this group has um, very kind of similar properties. It's very it's closely related to that. But um, it has a distinguishing feature of having very weak signals for the variant and the normal. So, so there's, there's, a, there's a hint of a, of a germline polymorphism there um, that's captured when you look at the data together, but would be a, essentially a, um, a miscalled if, if you look just to look at one, one, um, uh, one case or the other. Okay, so, um, so that's the story in terms of somatic mutations. It's not an easy process. So I review grants all the time that um, say that, well, I'm just going to sequence um, 10 tumor normal genomes, and I'm going to find the mutations. But it's not an easy process. It's the, we're still at the stage where we're learning about the imperfections of the data, um, what biases the machines introduce, and, um, and, and, and understanding the pervasiveness of germline polymorphisms. And so I would encourage everyone to, who's you know, uh, doing a sequencing experiment to just bear these things in mind. Um, it's, not, it's an imperfect science. It's not sequence and ye shall find. It's um, sequence, predict, validate. Okay. Uh, I have a question. Here, uh, I think you use 50 triple negative breast cancer there. So. If you increase this 50 to like 500, how do you expect that the result will change? And then the second thing, what would change if you wouldn't focus on a subgroup, like if you would look at all breast yeah. cancer, or if you focus on an even smaller subgroup, like based on the new finding? Yeah, so, so these are, this is really designed at trying to get at not the biological variability, but, but the machine variability. And so what we found is we've, we've applied this, this framework now in different tumor types. And it works very, very well. Um, in fact, um, it, it, so we now basically have a, a whole pipeline that um, essentially has incorporated this at the Genome Sciences Center. And, and so a, a, basically every tumor normal pair that goes through um, the, the, the Genome Center there uses this to call um, somatic mutations. And we found that the, the validation rate is very, very high. Um, before we started this, we, we were getting huge false positive rates and, and now when we when we go back and revalidate the the, the um, validation rate is very very high so so I think it's not a tumor type specific phenomenon because um, I, I mean like subgroups because imagine like um, I can imagine that if you mix this triple negative with PR positive patients then you know you'll get like complete different maybe uh, mutations and then maybe like you won't go through the filter because of yeah, yeah, but but, so, so, but that's that's biological variability. Yeah. This is only concerned with machine variability, machine noise. So it should be completely immune to what you're talking about. And then how about the sample size? So the sample size, um, uh, this is this sample size is based on number of events, right? So yes, the three thousand mutations were found from fifty triple negative breast cancers, but. Um, 
But what matters here is, is actually the number of events that we're looking at. So if we were to look at only 100 mutations, um, let's say one came from each of 100 different tumors, um, that would be underpowered to, to, to actually learn all these features. Um, and, but if we were to look at, um, let's say, 1,000 or 5,000 mutations from one tumor, that's probably going to be enough. It's, it, the, what matters is the number of data points, not where they came from. The number of mutations that you yeah. want. The, the advantage of, of, of extra cases is that um, there are different uh, there are different sequencing runs that may have generated them. So so the inter experimental variability um, of the machines themselves might be captured better with more cases. So I'm going to get into uh, uh, how we uh, applied some of these tools in a in a recent in a recent study. So. And this is joint with uh, Sam Apricio uh, at the BC Cancer Agency. So all this uh, machinery was really developed for the purpose of looking at tumors and, and answering questions about tumor biology. So uh, we decided to focus on triple negative breast cancers. And this is a molecular subtype of breast cancer. And it's really defined for what it, what it isn't. So it does not express the, the clinical biomarkers. I talked about HER2 and I talked about ER this morning. Um, these are tumors that don't express either of those markers. Um, and so, as a consequence, there's no targeted therapy. Um, it's the most aggressive type of breast cancer, affecting about 12 to 15 percent. Um, it has a very poor prognosis, affects younger women disproportionately, and really the mutations that cause this cancer are largely unknown. So, we set out to accumulate um, a fairly large cohort. Um, these are, as I mentioned, these are quite rare. And so, uh, so we collected 140 tumor samples from patients in the UK and Canada. Um, and, and a major point is that all these tumors were resected uh, early in the clinical course. And so basically at the time of diagnosis, um, surgery was indicated and the tumor was removed. And, and, and that's, that's where, uh, that's a time point in the clinical course that these um, these samples were generated. Uh, so we sequenced 65 tumor normal exome pairs. Uh, we generated copy number arrays and we also generated RNA-seq, but I'm going to focus on the, the genome part. And, and the major goals of this were really to uh, identify all the somatic mutations that occurred in these tumors um, and, and to resequence the mutations to obtain the mutational abundance. And, and this is about that digital allelic frequency counting that, um, that I was talking about earlier. And, and what we wanted to do uh, with this data is, is try to infer the properties um, or the characteristics of clonal evolution. So, um, so, you know, what was the clonal composition of these tumors at diagnosis? And, um, and then what can we learn from that about the mutational and clonal evolution spectrum um, within this disease? So the first observation is that uh, these cancers varied quite widely in their mutational load. So this is the number of uh, non-synonymous protein coding changes that we observed uh, for each case. So each bar here represents uh, the number of mutations uh, for a given uh, tumor. And, um, and, and so you saw this, we saw this wide range of, uh, of mutations all the way down to two cases where we didn't find any, zero. Um, so we went from 200 to, to zero and, and pretty much everything in between. So, so that was quite interesting. Um, and this is not at all related to um, uh, tumor cellularity. Uh, so you can imagine that if you had a, um, uh, a tumor where, um, or a sample where most of the cells were normal, you'd have a hard time trying to find a, a mutation. Uh, but this is unrelated to that. Um, and and then the other thing that we noticed is that, uh, that, that was, uh, I think, relevant here is that um, even some of these cases at the lower end of the spectrum in terms of mutations had abundant copy number mutations. So that, that's what this, this, green, um, this green curve shows is essentially the percentage of genome that was altered by somatic copy number changes. So, so in this case, you know, you have uh, uh, one, a t I think it's a, this tumor had a, a single mutation um, but had a, a, a large 
percentage of its genome is altered um, by copy number changes. Okay. Is this exome sequencing? This is exome, se exome sequencing. Exome sequencing. Okay. So do you think there's a lot of other things that are missing? Oh, sure. Yeah, sure. Um, so, so I think a couple of things that are probably mutations outside the, uh, the exome that, uh, that, drive, that are driver mutations. So, for example, in transcription factor binding sites or, or promoter regulator, re regulatory regions um, or in uh, non-coding RNAs uh, that affect the biology of the tumor and get selected for. Um, that, that, without a doubt, is probably the case. The other thing that's missing here is the epigenome, so um, uh, maybe a large part of the variation um, and, and, and phenotype of the cancer cells is driven by epigenetics and not, not necessarily genetics. So, so this is just looking at the genome and it's probably missing out on certain, certain components. Could be also be that these are just seen at um, different phases of their clinical, uh, of their evolutionary history. So, so it could be that these cancers are not evolved as much. And these cancers are, are uh, have, a, have had that time to accumulate uh, more mutations. Yeah, they're, they're all high grade. Um, yeah. yeah, that's right. Um, and and this one in particular is interesting because uh, this uh, this has a mutation in um, in a mismatch repair protein. So uh, and so so amongst the two hundred genes that are mutated here. Uh, there's a mismatch repair protein. So what's likely the case is that that tumor is able to accumulate mutations um, in, in a hyper hypermutator phenotype type of um, fashion. And so it accumulated a lot more mutations than others because of the specific um, defect in the mismatch repair protein. Okay. So so when we start to look at um, that's interesting that they had different mutational loads, uh, but we wanted to look at the gene content of those mutations. And so, um, so what's plotted here is essentially, uh, again, uh, a matrix where you have the cases on the bottom um, and then the genes on the, on the left. And then a box in this, um, in this matrix indicates that uh, a particular case had a mutation in a particular gene. And, and so the P53 gene is by far the most abundantly mutated gene in this, in this cancer type. Um, so just over 50% of cases had uh, mutations in P53, and that was known. Um, and then we see uh, other tumor suppressors such as P10 um, and RB1 are mutated uh, quite frequently. Um, and then uh, we saw mutations in PI3 kinase, which is also known. Um, so, so these four are really uh, well known before. Uh, but then what we had is we had a, a list of mutations that uh, was really quite surprising. So, so inf infrequent but not, um, not singleton mutations, singleton meaning just in one case, um, and, and when we started to do, we wanted to try to look at, okay, what, is, there, is there a biological signal in these, in these genes that are rarely mutated? Um, and so we did some pathway analysis and found that um, uh, a lot of these genes were in focal adhesion, integrin signaling, extracellular matrix, and actin cytoskeleton genes. And, and this all, all of the, these biological processes relate to cell shape and motility. And, um, and so, so what's... Uh, the clearest signal that emerged from this is that um, somehow these tumors are acquiring mutations in, in these pathways that govern cell shape and so and 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 focal adhesion so that may confer uh, a, a, a metastatic potential on those on those particular um, tumors um, and then the other thing that we noticed that, that is pretty particularly I think important here is that I mentioned that this is a disease for which there's no real targeted therapy but in 20 20% of the cases, we found mutations in uh, the EGFR kinase domain, ERB2 kinase domain, or, uh, and we even had one case with the BRAF V600E mutation. So this is, uh, this is the, the targeted mutation that's indicated in melanoma um, and has a, uh, a targeted agent against it. No one would think to give that targeted agent to a breast cancer patient, but maybe uh, because of the presence of this mutation, uh, that, tar that, that agent could be, could be applied in this case to that particular patient. We have no idea whether that you know, has toxicity levels uh, that are different in melanoma versus <laughs> breast cancers. Uh, all that stuff is, remains unanswered, and that has to be really determined in the context of clinical trials. But at least there are hints here that 
um, for at least 20% of the cases, there are uh, potentially actionable mutations that uh, an oncologist could prescribe an off-label drug that's already available, FDA approved, uh, and, and potentially put um, those patients on that, that context. So, so this, gives, um, this gives a lot of motivation to uh, sequence um, patients in the context of their, their clinical care. Yeah. So as long as at the end, they have no mutations in any of those genes. That's right, yeah. Uh, that's right, or a copy number. That's right. So the, the, these ones didn't have any, in any. They had mutations in other genes, but just not in this select. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So so uh, now I think this will get it. Um, so your, your question about how you know how we validated, and, and I wanted to just talk about this deep sequencing experiment. So so what we did for every single mutation in total, we found about twenty five hundred. Um, is that we we designed primers around the mutation. Um, and generated amplicons, and then uh, sequenced very, very deeply. So actually, we, the median, median redundancy around each mutation was 20,000-fold. And that was to really try to uh, uh, estimate um, what is the percentage of cells harboring each mutation. And you go back to that slide that I showed where um, you have your pool of DNA, and, and some portion of the DNA fragments have a mutation, and, um, and you want to try to recapitulate that and measure that uh, according to this. So, so the one problem with this um, is just take, taking, you know, just this data is that, uh, as we sh found out this morning, um, copy number changes also alter the allelic frequency uh, of, of, a, of a particular locus. And so, um, and so really, the uh, allelic abundance or allelic frequency that we can get from sequencing a mutation is, is actually derived from a mixture of many different things. So it's the copy number, it's the heterogeneity, it's the normal contamination. And so, so here's what copy number uh, or, or loss of heterozygosity does to the allelic frequency. So here's a simplest situation where you have a diploid uh, genome, okay? Uh, you have two copies, and one of the copies acquires a mutation. If all your cells are exactly the same, and so you have a pure sample, uh, then that... Uh, when you do this experiment of, of deeply sequencing, 50% um, of the reads should actually harbor the mutation, okay, on average. So you should get a very clear representation of that. And so if you were to do, let's say, a diploid cell line, and you were to look at a heterozygous SNP, chances are the allelic frequency when you deeply sequence it would be somewhere around 50%. Um, if you have uh, this situation that is then followed by a loss of the wild type allele, so the, the non mutated allele, that should result in actually all the alleles of that particular locus should be around 100%. Should, should, they should all have the mutation. Um, and similarly, if you then have a copy neutral, um, uh, that this, this situation where this allele gets duplicated, you'd also have allelic frequency of 100%. So the, the confounding thing is that um, you could have. Uh, the, the following situation, where you have copy neutral LOH that happens first, followed by a mutation that will yield um, a 50% allelic ratio. So the presence of a mutation within a copy neutral LOH region doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get 100%. You could get 50%. Okay, it depends on, it's depending on the order of events. Does that make sense? Okay. And so then we can also imagine the scenario with, let's say, 50% of the cells. Um, have this particular genotype. That would also yield a 50% allelic frequency. So we have all these competing explanations for, for what could give rise to our observation. And what we try to do is actually uh, deconvolute that uh, with, a, with a probabilistic model. And, and, um, and so we call this model PyClone. And uh, so what it takes into account is it takes into account this allelic abundance measurement, um, takes into account the copy number state, the LOH state, and, um, and then tries to essentially leverage the concept that um, mutations probably accrue in, in waves of clonal expansion and selection. And so there should be groups of mutations that have approximately the same clonal frequency. So we try to take advantage of that, uh, and that's the assumption, the fundamental assumption in the model. And this is what we got at. So what's shown here is our six plots uh, what, for, for six different cases. And on the x-axis here is the clonal frequency, so, so the percentage, estimated percentage of cells that harbor the mutation from 1 down to 0. And then each one of these rows represents a mutation. 
what these little distributions show is essentially what's the posterior distribution that a particular mutation has a clonal frequency. So this is a probabilistic model uh, using uh, Markov chain Monte Carlo. And so you don't just get an estimate of, you know, it's, it's this. It's you get the distribution around what, what the actual estimate is. And that's, what, that's what's shown here. And so, so what we found is really quite interesting. So, so here's an example in the top, top row are three cases with essentially um, most of the mutations were around the same. So, so this would be kind of a, a, a genomically um, not very clonally diverse, so more clonally homogeneous um, tumor, where most of the mutations were just either in, in one or two groups. And the, the groups are, um, are, are, uh, are just colored um, with different colors, okay? And in the bottom row, I showed three examples. Of, of tumors that um, had uh, much more clonal diversity, so whereby we had some mutations that were quite frequent, but other mutations that were quite rare. If you think back to that tree of, of Peter Noel's tree, right, where um, the early mutations uh, get propagated forward throughout the evolutionary process, and late mutations are probably only harbored in, in, in a few cells, that's what we think is, is being recapitulated here. And so, um, and so you had, we had a, a fair number of tumors that exhibited patterns like this. And, and you have to remember that these are all um, resected basically at, at diagnosis. And so, um, so, so in terms of their clinical course, they're all just taken out right away and, um, and, and at the time of diagnosis. But it's very clear is that at that time when they're first diagnosed, they're already quite, quite varied in, in terms of their evolutionary uh, diversity. And, uh, and this is something that, that was not known at all before. And, and the implications of this is that these tumors are currently treated with the same treatment protocol. So they're treated uniformly, but they're clearly all different. Um, and that's, that's a problem um, if we want to make some headway in terms of, uh, uh, of making some, some progress in this disease. So the last thing I, I really want to talk about is, is this idea of temporal inference of, of mutations. So, so now I'm showing one of these matrices again, and, and instead of um, just plotting the type of variant, uh, I'm, I'm plotting the estimated clonal frequency where the dark boxes represent uh, high clonal frequency and the, the lighter boxes uh, represent um, low clonal frequency. And what, what's interesting here is that, so we can ask questions about which mutations are the earliest events That's, and which mutations occur later. In, in the evolutionary history of the tumor. And it has some implications for how the, the, the biology of the tumor develops. And so quite gratifyingly, most of the P53 mutations um, were uh, considered uh, clonally dominant or, or had high clonal frequency. And the implication there is that they happened early. They're, they're one of the first initiating tumor events. And that's very consistent what, with what we know about P53. I think somebody asked about this. Um, you know, is there, is there a phenotype that can be essentially, you know, uh, where the, you know, the gatekeeper is, is lost. And, and that's really probably what's going on here, is that this is a gatekeeper gene that's deleted early, and that allows the uh, accumulation of, a dif uh, of additional mutations. However, that wasn't the case for all the tumors. We actually had some that, um, that where P53 looks like it occurred later on, and that's quite interesting as well. So, so that's, um, it's not a, a hard written rule that P53 mutations are the earliest event in every cancer. Um, the other thing that, uh, yeah. No, I was just wondering, you know, there's some other mutations there, so why is there a combination of mutations? Absolutely, yeah. Is there corrected for the stroma? Yeah, that's right, yeah, yeah, they are. That's right. So, um, so then, then I've also shown the, the genes involved in, um, in focal adhesion and, and integrin signaling here. And so, um, so it was natural to ask the question um, from a pathway perspective, are there pathways that appear to be um, mutated late in the evolutionary history of the tumor? And are there pathways that appear to be mutated early in the evolutionary history? And the results of this um, are shown here in this uh, enrichment map. And what this is is projecting genes onto pathways. Uh, you're going to do this exercise, I think, uh, tomorrow. Um, you may actually, I'm not sure, Gary mentioned that he might actually try to work with this data, um, but uh, I'm not sure if he, he got that far. But anyways, um, you, you'll make a diagram like this tomorrow. No, uh, Friday. Oh, Friday. Uh, tomorrow and Friday you're going to make a diagram. It's very exciting. Um, so uh, so what, what, what I've done here is uh, we colored... Um, 
we took the distribution of, of clonal frequency, go back here. So we took this, this distribution here, um, and, uh, and, and essentially we asked uh, of each pathway whether they had a, a, the same um, shape of the distribution. And if they didn't have the same shape, they were, if, if they were dominated by early events, then, then we color it red. And if they were dominated by late events, then we color, color it um, lighter. And so what, was, what came out is essentially uh, these fundamental tumor initiating type of pathways like cell cycle checkpoint, um, RB tumor suppressor checkpoint, um, the, the fundamental cancer pathways, tumor suppressor, uh, PI3 kinase, P53 feedback, cell cycle checkpoint, all of these fundamental processes that would actually create a tumor, um, those happen early. The pathways associated with focal adhesion, uh, integrin signaling, focal adhesion, uh, where is it here, um, they, they tended to happen late. So, so the, the mutations that were found in those pathways uh, had lower clonal frequencies, uh, statistically speaking. And, and so the inference there is that um, there's a, a progression of, of biological mm -hmm. events. First, you need to abrogate your cell cycle checkpoint uh, to become a tumor. And then in order to, to spread and invade or, uh, or, beca or, or, or uh, become independent from, from your neighbors, then, then you need to uh, abrogate focal adhesion and intervention signaling pathways. Yes? But these uh, mutations may not be in the same clone. They may be in different clones. That's, that's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah, that's true. They could be. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's the only way to answer that is with single cell sequencing. Yes. Yeah, and, and so you know the, uh, the mutation combination. That yeah, that. exactly right. So ultimately, selection operates at the single cell level, and um, probably operates on the whole genotype. And so that that's where we're actually now trying to validate all this with single cell sequencing to see which mutations happen together and which ones are exclusive of each other. Yeah. Okay. So 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 that's um, that's all I want to say on that. Uh, that paper and that was that was published last month um, and uh, is is available online. So um, so in summary, then triple negative breast cancer is a disease defined by exclusion with no targeted treatment strategies. We found actionable mutations in about twenty percent of cases, and and I just want to make the point that uh, mutations can tell us much more uh, than just the genes they affect. So we we tend to think of mutations as these kind of binary entities, but if we think of the aggregate um, profile of mutations, we saw that um, these, these cancer exhibited heterogeneous mutational load, um, heterogeneous mutational profiles in terms of their gene content, and, and even heterogeneous clonal population structures and evolutionary stage. And so, uh, so we've taken a group that um, is defined as a kind of a, a homogeneous entity and, and showed that it has huge vari variation um, and shouldn't be classed as, as one, one disease. Um, likely this will have to be uh, dealt with in, in terms of individual uh, therapeutic options. Okay, so that's the kind of applied work. Uh, and I'll just finish now with, um, with just going over some of the uh, available tools for, for mutation finding since, since we want to actually do this in the lab. So, uh, so one of the more popular tools is, is SAM tools, and this is a, a suite of tools uh, for working with alignment files, um, and and really that are that are represented in the standard community standard SAM or BAM format. Um, so, have you, did you work with SAM tools yesterday? Yes. No. Yes. Maybe so. Yes. Okay. Okay. BWA and SAM and and SAM tools. Good. Um, this is a, a nice piece of software because it's fast and, and memory efficient um, and it can be compiled anywhere on your Windows machine or on your Linux machine or on your Mac machine. Um, the other very popular tool is the uh, Genome Analysis Toolkit, GETK, from the Broad Institute. Um, this is implemented in Java and I think, uh, are you going to go over, yes, yeah, so Gavin's going to go over GETK uh, in the lab. Um, there's an emerging, and I, I, I do say emerging, standard of how to represent variants uh, in, in terms of um, uh, a store standard format in the community. And, um, and, and the format that's you know, being adopted is this VCF format. Um, are, are you going to go over VCF format, Kevin? Okay, okay. This, last year we did, but... Sorry? Okay, they're going to go and learn. Okay, so you'll explore uh, VCF format, the variant calling format. 
Um, and and the, the strength here is actually uh, a lot of the features that we executed in that mutation seek study uh, were, were actually derived from the VCF format. And you can look at how, to, wh how those features are encoded. There are, uh, if you look at the dates of, uh, of these papers, these are the only three papers that deal specifically with the somatic mutation detection problem, as far as I know. Um, more are coming out, but um, as of right now, or as of a few months ago, um, uh, there are really three, and they're all published almost within weeks of each other, actually, uh, in bioinformatics. Uh, and so, so the community's only just getting to grips with this. Um, we're only in the very first stages of, of, of trying to model somatic mutations from tumor normal data. Um, and these are some of the tools that are available. So two from my lab, one from the um, WashU, um, and then the Broad Institute has their own um, uh, color that you can get um, by request. And uh, the Sanger Institute um, uh, now has now, for the first time, um, they, their paper on breast cancer just appeared uh, about 10 days ago, uh, and they refer to, uh, to their, their um, internal code base as well, their platform for calling somatic mutations. Uh, so for visualization, uh, IGV is, is, is nice, and I showed you examples of that. Um, and then uh, annotation. So one thing that's one thing I didn't really get over. So how do you go from a genomic coordinate uh, to, to knowing whether you know your mutation actually affects a protein uh, or is it synonymous, uh, some synonymous variant, non-coding, non-synonymous variant? There's a very nice system developed out of Chris Sanders' lab at Sloan Kettering called Mutation Assessor that we use. Um, probably more than they, they want us to, but we use it anyways. Uh, and, uh, and this is a nice way of projecting genomic coordinates with specific nucleotide substitutions onto amino acid uh, and putting protein context, and I think we're going to do that in the lab too. So one thing we didn't cover, and we're probably not going to cover in depth, but, but you certainly need to be made aware of it, uh, are insertions and deletions. So, so how do we deal with that? Um, small insertions and deletions are often harbored by tumor suppressor genes and confer uh, frame-shifting translation and loss of protein expression. So P53, BRCA, um, all of those tumor suppressor type genes harbor these indels and they're important to find. Um, there are, uh, what, what is very clear is that indels in short read data are much harder to detect than single nucleotide variants. Um, and so the, the, the literature is just really catching up with this. Um, what's very likely is that they'll require uh, more sensitive and specific aligners. So, so BWA is probably just not going to cut it for, for indels. Um, you need to use a more principled method that can actually uh, open a gap when necessary in the alignment. But there are some tools available. And, uh, and one, one strategy is actually de novo assembly. Uh, and that should, should actually uh, be the preferred strategy. But of course, that's computationally intensive and, and is difficult. So I just wanted to also say now that, um, and we're just going to wrap up, is that um, it's really important to understand the sources of artifacts in the data. Um, I'll reemphasize that the biology of cancer is complex. Uh, we're still in, in an era where a few tools exist specifically for cancer data. We're trying to make, make that, ameliorate that, that, that uh, situation. Um, slowly but surely, we're getting there. Um, uh, and, and, and all these new experimental designs, including single cell genomics of cancer, uh, these are going to warrant brand new uh, analytical problems. And so, uh, they represent new statistical challenges that need to be addressed if we're really to fully define the cancer mutational landscapes. Ultimately, uh, what I think will emerge from sequencing individual tumors uh, is, is potentially not just using archival samples, but actually uh, potentially using this in the clinical context under the guise of an oncologist. Um, and, and, and I think this is apropos in, in the context of what uh, Peter Noel uh, concluded his paper in 1976. So, so I'll, I'll just bear with me and I'll just read this. So the, the acquired genetic instability and associated selection process most readily recognized cytogenetically uh, results in advanced human malignancies being highly individual karyotypically and biologically. So individual is the key word there. Hence, each patient's cancer may require individual specific therapy. And even this may be thwarted by the emergence of a genetic 
variant, genetically variant subline resistant to the treatment. And more research should be directed towards understanding and controlling the evolutionary process in tumors before it reaches the late stage usually seen in, in clinical cancer. Well, um, what's really interesting is that uh, you know, he was talking about this without having the tools that we have today. Uh, and we have at our, as a, at our disposal the ability to now, uh, in a cost-effective way, apply sequencing technologies to, to individual patients to get at some of these questions. And, and I would suggest that the road to personal therapy uh, will be paved with mutations. Uh, this is what we need. We need to look at each cancer in its mutational context. Um, but we really have a lot of work to do to identify targetable, actionable mutations and understand how drugs drive selection in different tissue microenvironments and cell types. So I'll just leave you with those thoughts and, uh, and thank a whole number of people, uh, specifically uh, uh, Sam and David, uh, who are uh, really great close colleagues and, and uh, have inspired a lot of this work. Um, all the people in my lab, including, including Gavin, um, contributed to, to the studies that I presented today. Um, and, and, and actually, the, the courageous patients as well who donated their tumor, t their tumor specimens to research. We couldn't do the work, um, certainly, without them. Uh, and, uh, and, and then finally, just a, a note that uh, I am recruiting people, and so if you like some of the work that you've seen in, the, in, in today's presentation, just give me a call and uh, send me an email, and, uh, and it'd be great to, uh, to chat about possibilities. Um, and I think at this point, I'll, uh, I'll turn it over. Are we going to take a break? Or? Okay, so... Okay, so we'll take a break till 3.30, and uh, thanks a lot for your attention, and uh, enjoy the rest of the workshop.